I Hate the News is the weekly news bulletin from I Hate Politics podcast, a show about a human activity we love to hate. I am Sunil Dasgupta. The week of May 28th, 2024. Montgomery County Public Schools and the County Council play hot potato over the school budget. Proposed cuts include ending the school district's virtual academy and over 100 positions. A federal district court in Baltimore allows the estate of Henrietta Lacks to sue a company involved in using her stem cells for research and profit without her consent. City of Rockville looks at moving its big annual music festival, Hometown Holidays, back to its original location in downtown Town Center. And what about shutting down a high school greenhouse for the growingest season of the year, the summer? Music for this episode comes from the bands Soul Tet and Capital Effect, playing at Rockville's Hometown Holidays, over the Memorial Day weekend. In Montgomery County, the County Council and the Board of Education are known to play hot potato. And they did it again over the 2025 school year budget. The school system is guaranteed by law to get a 3% inflation protection, which would have worked out to just short of $100 million this year. They asked instead for $187 million. The county executive knocked that down to $128 million. The county council gave them $157 million. That's about $30 million less than what they had asked for, or 1% of the school budget itself. County Council President Andrew Friedson was on the show last week, putting the ball firmly in the school board's court. It's a $3.3 billion budget. The county council provides funding to the school system, and the school system decides how to prioritize that funding. So ultimately, they're going to have to make decisions, as they always do. And they're going to be held accountable to those decisions as we are held accountable to ours. And boy, did they respond. MCPS and the Board of Education have now announced plans to increase class size by one student across the board, which would allow 100 to 150 positions to be cut. They are going to stop 200 new hires, eliminate the online virtual academy, set up after the pandemic, among other programs, postpone pre-K expansion, and have made promises of unspecified central office staffing and contract cuts. Even before the announcement, County Council member Evan Glass was infuriated. We are minutes away from approving our FY25 budget, a the parameters of which were agreed to last week by the full council and straw votes. The week before, we had a full conversation with every department and agency to ask specific questions about their budget, which was predated by a series of committee hearings. And the school board is meeting now in emergency session to talk about a budget that they saw, participated in, and knew what was happening. And they're giving us information now about our decisions. Shame on them. It should be pointed out that despite his ire, Glass continues to politically support school board members who are part of a unanimous decision to move forward with these cuts. Meanwhile, outside the Board of Education offices in Rockville, the local teachers' union, Montgomery County Education Association, also known as MCEA, gathered in protest. We need money that you all took! We need teachers! We need books! We need the money that you all took! Stop from the top! Stop from the top! Stop from the top! We know... 
that we are already overworked. Yes. Yeah. Under resourced. Yes. Yes. We don't have enough staff, and it is insane to think that the way to fix that problem is to cut more staff, give us more work, cre uh, create untenable situations for us, and even more importantly, for our students. Yes. That's David Stein, the incoming president of NCEA. The school board will vote on a final budget June 11th. Alongside the teachers' union, some families with children in the virtual academy had also gathered in protest. Hi there, my name is Rakesh Kumar. Niharika Singh. Sia. Arnav Kumar. Why do you like the Montgomery uh, any Virtual Academy? Um, it? Because you're just more safe, you can, you can study in the comfort of your home and you get tasty home-cooked meals. My kids have only been in school through Virtual Academy. They've never stepped in in a regular school. Which school would they go to if they had to, if you put them there? Judith, Judith Res Resnick. Judith Resnick. Okay. And do you like Judith Resnick Elementary? Yes, it's a good school. It's a good, it's a good, good school? school? Yes. And the reason that you keep them home is then? Well, we started with the COVID. Right. So, and it kept on working well for the kiddos. And we continue through the process, you know. And uh, uh, also safety issue, safety which is in the background, bullying. I would be really hesitant to keep my kids in MVA if they were doing poorly. Yes. So he is at the top of his class yes. and he loves it. You can ask him. You can ask him what does he love? Yes. You know, what do you love? Um, I love mad, reading, science, all all um, reading and uh, study related topics. My name is Sterling High. For uh, us particularly, we have a medical condition, a couple of our family members do, that make it high risk for us to be in a in-person environment in school. And so the virtual academy was the only way for a public education in a safe environment. Where would they go if they actually went to school? Uh, so we we are zoned for Rolling Terrace, which is in Tacoma Park, right? And so it's not it's not that it's necessarily a, a bad option to go. It's just that it's not physically safe, medically safe for, for our family at this time. And it's not a forever thing, but for now, it, it's our only option. Do you have a timeline when it would be okay? Sure, for us, because COVID is the unique. Uh, risk for us uh -huh. when there is neutralizing vaccines that actually stop infection instead of the, the normal vaccines that we have today stop extreme and uh, you know like adverse reactions uh -huh. there are now 800 students in the virtual academy down from close to 2000 a couple of years ago in baltimore a federal district court judge ruled that a lawsuit brought by the estate and family of Henrietta Lacks can proceed against the California-based company Ultragenics Pharmaceuticals for unjust enrichment. If you don't know the story of Henrietta Lacks, it is fascinating. In January 1951, 31-year-old black Dundalk resident Henrietta Lacks visited the Johns Hopkins University Hospitals colored ward in Baltimore, Maryland, for what turned out to be a cervical cancer diagnosis. Doctors extracted the tumor and sent it for culture and investigation. She received radiation therapy, which did not work, and she died nine months later in October 1951. The cells she left behind as part of the biopsy have been mass-produced, traveled into space, used to develop the polio vaccine, and have made possible big discoveries in genetics. She became and remains immortal. The part that is problematic is that the doctors at Johns Hopkins Hospital, the lab that received the tumor cells, and several pharmaceutical companies that have since benefited from the cells, did not have her consent or that of her family after her death, to use the cells for research and business. And certainly, they did not compensate the family. This kind of consent, which is legally required today, was not required in 1951. Companies that benefited from the cells have also claimed statute limitations. But the lax estate 
and its lawyers argued that these companies continue to benefit from those cells to this day and therefore owe the estate compensation. The National Institutes of Health was the first to acknowledge the problem in 2013. They didn't award any compensation, but gave the Lax family some control of the DNA code extracted from Henrietta's cells. Johns Hopkins reviewed the case and found that the university or the hospital had not benefited from the cells whatsoever, and has now proposed to name a new building after her. In 2023, Thermo Fisher Scientific, a Massachusetts company, reached a settlement with the Lax estate over compensation. And now the lawsuit against Ultragenics can proceed. If you are interested, there is a best selling 2010 book on Henrietta Lax, which really made subsequent movement on the case possible. It's called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks and was written by Rebecca Sklut. For 36 years of Memorial Days, the city of Rockville has celebrated fallen heroes with a music festival called Hometown Holidays. The festival used to be held in downtown Rockville but moved to Redgate Park in 2022. Redgate is a city-owned green space that used to be a golf course. Thousands of people from the city and the region showed up for two days of the festival. The city spends quite a bit on hosting the festival, quite possibly about $300,000, which is about half the special events budget for the Recreation and Parks Department in 2023-2024. This year, the two music stages, sound and light equipment from the company Harford Sound alone is believed to have cost 50000 not including transportation and labor. The artists this year included the popular 1990s band Everclear. The city council is now considering moving the event back to downtown Rockville, which would potentially reduce costs and drive business to local restaurants and bars instead of having food trucks come in. More news to come. The school year is ending and teachers are busy planning how they will close up their classrooms for the summer. But Glenn Miller, who runs the Greenhouse at Sherwood High School, has a special challenge. Closing up his greenhouse operation during the best gardening months of the year. I asked him why we can't keep the greenhouse open over the summer. That's a good question. Uh, the first would be that I am not employed during the summer. Uh, I'm a 10-month school employee, so I'm not around to run the greenhouse. And since it is a classroom, like the whole school building, it gets a, a good cleaning during the summer, and I can't be around while they are cleaning the classroom. Um, secondly, it gets too hot in the classroom, or in the greenhouse, excuse me, and it's too hot for the plants that we have to, we would have to maintain. Um, and the cooling system in there is just not able to keep up with the temperature that we have here in the DMV. So it's not feasible really to have plants in there so why not use volunteers to keep the operation going? Maybe take the plants from the greenhouse outside and have volunteers take care of it. That would require somebody's supervising the volunteers. And then we're back to problem number one, which is I'm not an employee during the summertime. Okay. So what do you have to do in order to close down the greenhouse for the summer? All of the plants have to come out. And then it's got to be swept. Uh, and then I've got to turn off all of the, the cooling systems, the fans. You mentioned getting rid of all the plants that you have. I was in your greenhouse a few days ago. So you have a lot of them. The plan is to have uh, two sales Thursday and Friday, uh, weather permitting, uh, outside at the greenhouse, Sherwood High School. 
Anyone who wants more information can email me. My email is G L E N N underscore J underscore Miller, M I L L E R, at mcpsmd.org. So this is Thursday and Friday, May 30th and 31st, between 3 and 5 p.m., outside of the Sherwood High School greenhouse, which is in the back of the school. That's correct. Good luck. Thank you. And have a good summer. If you like foraging, mulberries and service berries are now out. Look down when you walk and when you see discolored sidewalks, look up. That's your tree. Mulberries look similar to blackberries and service berries are also called June berries and have a little crown. Always check to be sure the type of berry before you eat it. These are a delicious part of our local edible ecosystem and great for humans and birds. That's all for this episode. Be sure to check out our feature interview series that comes out Friday mornings. I Hate Politics is produced by me, Sunil Dasgupta, and assistant producers Daniel Galeo, Katarina Gasek, and Catherine Amaya Escobar, with support from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I direct UMBC's political science program at the universities of Shady Grove in Montgomery County, where, among other things, we explore and learn about politics, government, and society close to home. Music for this episode comes from the bands Soul Tet and Capital Effect, playing at Rockville's hometown holidays over the Memorial Day weekend. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone else who might want to, please email us at producer at ihppod.org. See you next time. Just a short bang, bang,